From Microbe TV, this is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 25, recorded on December 20th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hey, Vincent. How's it going? It's good to be back. Also joining us from New York, Tim Chung. Hi, everyone. Hi, Vincent. Hi, Jason. Nice to be back. What's it like in Salt Lake, Jason? Is it crazy or is a lot of cases exploding? What? Um, well, you know, I, I think that, yeah, Utah, the cases are exploding. Um, nothing's changed. Everyone's just living their lives. Like it's nothing's happening. Um, (laughs) so, you know, the, obviously the university, my lab, we're all boosted even. So Mm. I think we, we, we feel pretty, pretty safe here at work, but outside of that, yeah, you go to the grocery store and you're like, well, okay, no one's wearing masks and Yeah. (laughs) Probably you don't have a very high vaccination rate in the state, right? Not in the state. So I think Salt Lake's not too bad in the county, but um, outside of that, yeah, it's a worry. Yeah. All right, we thought we'd do some email. You guys have been sending us letters for, well, emails anyway, for quite a while, and we haven't had a chance. So we'd like to catch up. This is our last episode for 2021. This is like this first full year of the pandemic, right? It's just dominated by the pandemic, which... It it feels like it's been 10 years. It does. It feels like a long time. Um, We're supposed to go back. So Columbia went back to in-person teaching in the fall. I hope we stay that way. I don't want to go back online just because of a stinking variant. (laughs) (laughs) So fingers crossed. All right, uh, let's go through and we'll, we'll do round robins. Uh, Jason, why don't you take that first one? All right, so yeah, so this is from Katie Jane. And she says, hi all, I recently came across Twin after getting caught up with Twip and Twiv. And I thought I'd write in to let you know how much I enjoy it. My, my knowledge of neuroscience is very basic. I teach a couple of lectures on the nervous system and freshmen so more level anatomy and physiology classes. Additionally, my mom suffered a severe stroke four years ago. She has made a remarkable recovery, and if you did not know her previously, you would not be able to tell other than she now suffers from aphasia. Uh, It has led to some interesting communication communication mishaps, and all of us have had to hone our artistic skills. I love the dynamics between the various twin hosts and with you guys, and I really feel like I'm sitting in a bar just enjoying a conversation. I'll admit some of the materials are over my head, but what I really enjoy is the critical evaluation of the papers. You sometimes comment that you're being reviewer three, but I actually find that part interesting. I'm not the best at crit- critically evaluating scientific research. So hopefully by hearing you guys' thoughts on it, I'll learn what better what to look for. Thanks again for yet another great podcast. Uh, I guess there was no question there, but, but thanks, yeah. Katie, for um, writing in. And sorry to hear about your mom. I think the, the stroke uh, recovery from stroke is always an interesting, you know, um, phenomenon. We we think of brain plasticity as being well. We used to think of brain plasticity as being something that only young young people and kids have, but really the the brain, even the adult brain, has a lot of plasticity, and it's remarkable that um, you can get a, almost a full recovery from a stroke that can damage that part of the brain that that's required for language and and reading um, to the point where someone comes out of a stroke, can't even talk. And then they relearn how to talk from scratch uh, or even have to learn their, their motor skills from scratch as an adult. Um, Still, that's pretty painful to to watch. It takes a long time and effort. So there's definitely a lot of research on ongoing to try and figure out, how to boost plasticity in the adult brain and figure out what are those mechanisms that we can actually target into, um, both from a molecular side. So, you know, what are the genes and proteins and doing, doing in, in that kind of plasticity and 
um, why is the adult brain less plastic um, to sort of these interventions that are non-invasive and that can help um, boost recovery by taking advantage of how the brain actually learns as well. Uh, Tim, can you take the next one? Sure. Brando writes, Hello, Vincent. Looking back, looked back in my emails to figure out when I started watching TWIV, and the earliest reference I can find is mid-May last year. So I don't know which last year this is, but let's assume <laughs> 2020. Uh, now microbe.tv is in its various podcasts on science topics in my station of choice. Uh, is my station of choice. I just watched my first twin, which is episode 20. I don't know which one that is. Um, I plan to go back and watch from number one. I do see that you mostly manage a female present representation in most podcasts, which I suspect is no mean feat, given the likelihood that they are rather in the minority in the world of neurologists and neuroscientists and, and scientists in general, uh, I have to say. But it's better in the realm of biologists, I think, than you know physics or computer science. Um, I would be interested to know if there are any statistics about that. Um, I'm sure there is statistics about that, but I just don't know any on top of my head. My head, but I think it's quite well established that it is uh, male biased, um, at spe uh, especially in physics and chemistry. I think not sure about biology. Um, I thought I thought I would send you this as a possible lead into a podcast on how it impacts what neurologists study, how it is reported, and so on. I have not read the full article as it requires subscription. And anyway, microbe.tv will be first on my list for the British Sterlings <laughs> as I value the non-specialist angles that Rich Condit so ably supplies for TWIV. Um, Rich is very much a specialist there, I have to, uh, I have to uh, say. Um, and uh, Brenda linked an article on newscientists.com uh, which I clicked on, and, and it, New Scientist is a popular science publication from the UK. And unfortunately, I don't know about you guys, but NYU does not have a subscription to New Scientist, so I could not, uh, I cannot uh, read the whole article. But the title is Neuroscientists Are Ignoring the Differences Between Males and Females. Um, and uh, yeah, let's actually, um, and the first sentence says, top neuroscience research papers are eight times more likely to only study male participants or samples compared to female-only studies, a review has found. Hmm. Um, so this is going to be, sounds like this is in human uh, subjects. Um, so yeah, this, uh, this is obviously a problem. Um, uh, so Brenda con continues with uh, to write saying, one point in podcast 20 did catch my attention as a female, I would like to point out that uh, a permanent... Um, <laughs> as a, okay, Brenda, this is from Brenda. As a female, I would like to point out that a permanent unpleasant odor is not a feature of female toilets. I suspect that this is related to the absence of urinals. I would suggest that perhaps research into the design of this piece of plumbing might reduce the problem somewhat. That is not to say that there is no problem with odors in female toilets, cologne, perfumes, and hairsprays being the main culprit in my experience. But they are generally short-lived. Thank you again for all your podcasts. So now I know what uh, episode 20 is. It must be the one where you talked about smell. Mm. Um, uh, so Brenda, uh, that's from Brenda from Blackow, Scotland. Um, mm. Well, thank you, Brenda. Uh, <laughs> you know, this, so this issue of, of uh, male versus female participants does actually uh, have an issue in animal-based studies as well. So there's been a lot of um, uh, work to sort of suggest that, yes, you, you shouldn't just ignore working on females because there could be six differences in whatever you're studying. So now, you, now the NIH actually uh, mandates that when you submit a grant, you have to give a very good reason why you don't want to look at both sexes, um, which, you know, which is, I think, a good thing. Um, and certainly when you're studying the brain and behavior, um, there's going to be differences between, uh, females and males in, in, in many ways. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So. Just to, just to develop on that, uh, I don't know whether, uh, you guys remember when we talked about the episode on lupus, um, Ori actually mentioned that lupus is more prevalent in females and it has somehow linked to, it is thought that it is linked to, um, 
hormones, female hormones, because the onset usually is adolescence. Um, and I, I think a lot of, I think listening to like immune and also TWIF, um, uh, I think a lot of autoimmune disease, uh, autoimmune disease as a whole is more prevalent also in female, it is found. Um, what is very weird is that in, in contrast, uh, Parkinson's disease, which uh, our lab study, is more prevalent in males. So there's definitely sex differences in a lot of these uh, diseases. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I found a uh, article at NIH: Women in the biomedical workforce. In 2014, women earned half of all science and engineering bachelor's degrees, and a little less than half of all science and engineering. But in 2015, women constituted less than a quarter of all full professorships with science, engineering, and health doctorates at research-intensive institutions. Women similarly comprise about half of all medical school graduates but are underrepresented among physician scientists and in all medical school faculty positions from assistant professor through chair. They comprise about half of the employees in the pharmaceutical and medical industries, but available data suggests they represent about 17% of senior management positions. That's always true. Uh, so the, the, the industry seems to do better, but both in industry and academics, the representation of women in senior management is very, very low. Yeah, overall. I think from just, just uh, observing around me, I think PhD students, the balance is probably more even. And then mm. going from PhD and postdoc to the faculty position, that great filter is very unforgiving for, to, to females, I think. Yeah, no, there's a big drop off there. I mean, I think there's a lot that institutions can do to help with that and um, that everything from child support to, to tenure cases, you know, giving giving more time and that sort of thing. But I, you know, I think, and I think a lot of this has also been exacerbated by the pandemic, but having, you know, so I think these are discussions that leadership at institutions should be having for sure. Yeah. All right, the next one is from... Ingrid, who writes, Dear Twinners, aside from the question of how it works, I naively wonder if maybe the reason for the constant remapping of olfactory and maybe other sensory input other than visual you discussed in Twin 20, drifting aromas, has to do with preventing a sort of wearing out of the original neural locations through constantly pressing on the same keys in a way. <laughs> Could this popular science article I came across have any bearing on this, and oh, this is a article from Quanta Magazine, which is just about ten blocks south of where I am, <laughs> oh. not, not too far from here. They have their headquarters. The brain rotates memories to save them from new sensations. They do very good. Uh, they do very good scientific articles. I have to say. It's, yeah, not yeah. a big fan of their stuff. The article talks about olfactory memories being. Temp temporarily stored in the sensory receptor area of the brain itself rather than immediately going into either short or long-term storage areas of the brain, but somehow in a rotated manner. The analogy was to rotating a piece of writing by 90 degrees in order to write something different onto the same piece of paper so as not to overlap and confuse a current sensation with the stored memory of that sensation, best as I can interpret, though not quite understanding the point of the paper. At first hearing, I disagreed with Jason about olfactory memories like banana being so obviously inherently less likely to drift compared to other memories, even though I do have some very strong smell linked to emotional memories from my childhood that are stronger emotionally than the drier, factual-seeming memory of the same event that I also have, but which might be a memory of a memory or even a constructed false memory from being told of the event over the years. If a subject didn't smell a banana again after the first time for many years, maybe. But otherwise, every time you smell a banana after the first time, couldn't your brain be correcting any drift that has happened to the first olfactory memory? Hmm. In, actu in actual fact, the taste and probably smell of bananas changed for all Americans sometime in the late 60s when the previous commercial monoculture variety called Big Mike died <laughs> off from disease and was replaced by a new and different tasting variety Cavendish. It's a monoculture too, so very susceptible to the same fate as Big Mike. That's apparently why artificially flavored banana candies, etc. today taste so different from the real thing. Aside from being cloying and artificial, the artificial hasn't, flavor hasn't been recalibrated from the Big Mike flavor. Mm. I never realized this until reading about it in recent years, but after reading about it, hmm, it seems to me that I do recall a different banana flavor 
from my childhood, yellower and less bland than today's bananas. As a side issue, I've been on a many years long quest to find my mother's old banana bread recipe from the back of the Graham flower box that was so much better than any banana bread I've had since. So sadly, aside from the missing flour to Graham flour ratio, it might be the actual banana that made the difference. Since even with relatively low, few olfactory receptors compared to other animals, we can distinguish so many different shades of smell in wine, rose varieties, bananas, etc. I imagine most things we think of as one discrete smell, like banana, probably comprise many different chemical odors in one soup of odors. Re with respect to that car-to-truck shift that Vivian alluded to, it must also happen with smells. So the shift in identified smell from banana to pineapple, for example, is probably a continuum without an obvious jump from one to the other. Uh, question. I've been searching and searching for a popular science article. I thought I recently read about how olfactory receptors, signals, neurons have now found to be ubiquitous throughout the brain or nervous system, aside from smell and pheromone reception areas, and may indicate a previously unknown and important signaling method. If you happen to know what I'm babbling about, I'd appreciate a link. Did you find it, uh, Tim? Yeah, so I got a couple of links in the show notes that we can put, uh, sorry, a couple of links in this Google Doc that we can uh, include okay. in the show notes. And people have, yeah, uh, you're correct, people have found mm. that there are uh, olfactory receptor expression in the brain. I don't know whether, not only that, but all the signaling, downstream signaling molecules are also expressed in those cells, it seems like. Um, but we don't know whether it is functional, whether it is actually mediating any signaling events. Mm -hmm. And for example, you don't think the aromatic uh, compound that is floating in the air that's, you know, signals banana would be going, obviously would not be going all the way deep into your brain to activate those receptors. So I'm guessing even if it's expressed, the role mm -hmm. uh, is completely unknown. For me, listening to Twin is like f trying to follow a deep discussion in a language I only have a rudimentary understanding of, like Swedish or French. I come away with an excited feeling of maybe having learned something, but on the other hand, I can't usually describe it to someone else, so the learning is probably an illusion. However, I really enjoy listening to you scientists working on interpreting new data, trying to make sense out of it. That's probably what is actually exciting. Just listening in on the process of scientific dis discovery about the universe around and inside us. Thanks for that and everything else you do. Uh, Berkeley, California, perfect weather here and somehow for once not the bottom of the funnel for all California smoke. Sorry, Jason, I wish you didn't have to be receiving it either. When was that smoke going over? That'll t tell us when this letter was written. Yeah, that was most of the summer, really. Um, those California okay. fires, we were... We're on the path, direct path for the wind to come here for most of the summer, unfortunately. Okay, okay. Hopefully it's, hopefully it's no longer burning. No, not anymore. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, my, I, I think this is going to be regular, regular occurrence mm -hmm. uh, over mm -hmm. time unless this drought breaks um, in, in, in the western states. So I'm hoping we have a good winter, um, lots of snow. snow. Big snowpack will help a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I remember... I remember going to a conference in uh, Ventura, California, and we went hiking to the hills, and it's like walking through Mordor because all the trees have been burnt down from the yeah. wildfire, and it's just yeah. everything is just black, yeah. no trees. Yeah, sad. So that, there was a lot of interesting things here in this le in this email. I didn't know about the banana, <laughs> the <different laughs> bananas. Yeah. Um, you know, in in the actual studies that. Um, you know, you look at olfactory, it's true that we are sort of just using these single molecules, these, uh, that we know smell of a very, to have a dis distinct smell. But in the end, most, most things we smell do have a combination of different volatile odors that mm. our, our brain is making sense of, um, and how it makes sense of the, the difference, you know, the difference in the concentrations of all the different, odors in the air is, is something that I think is fascinating because we are very good at sort of detecting um, at really high sensitivity some of these things. Um, but I guess I would say, you know, for a, the smell of banana, that sort of iner inherently prior to any exposure, most people like those smells. Like there's definitely smells where 
most people you ask them, does that smell bad? And you're like, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a terrible smell. So that's what I'm sort of saying. Like this, everyone has some of their own experiences with these smells and you can certainly change or alter your, um, preference or whatever based on your experiences for, if you know, some people who, who will eat a fruit and then get sick, for example, will associate, um, that smell forever almost with something unpleasant. Um, but I, but, but, you know, so the, so there is some innate sort of, um, balance, I would say, so, you know, bad, good or bad to, to smells, um, and how that sort of evolved is, is sort of interesting too. But, mm. but yeah, I mean, these categories of, um, the brain, the brain is really good at putting things into categories and the combinations of smells that end up being put in a banana probably are pretty wide, um, but still, you could still pinpoint the main, you know, uh, volatile, aromatic, or whatever it is that 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 is associated with the smell. Yeah, I think if you ask most people, like, can they consistently tell the difference between a banana and a pineapple, like just by smelling? I think they probably can. Right. However, if you like ask, like a a wine taste, like one of those wine tasting sommelier about, you know, this wine versus that wine, does it have a hint of? vanilla or <laughs> black pepper whatever i think that i think that is just uh more in your head than uh, more on a continuum let's say well i think than, i think there's some people that do have a sense of smell that's m- more acute than others or it's, it's trained uh hmm. but yeah i agree like someone's like oh yeah this smells like blackberry i'm like what are you talking about <laughs> it's just wine yeah I, yeah I know what you mean but i do think it's uh it just takes some training to sort out these are subtle yeah you know Odors I'm convinced I can smell, uh, I can tell the difference by just by opening a cage, whether the cage uh, of mice, sorry, but by opening a cage of mice, whether it is a cage of male mice or a cage of female mice. No, really? Mice. Yeah, Interesting. I think so. Um, but it's just mainly because maybe the male mice are just dirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could yeah. Be. And this, uh, this idea of sort of rotating memories. Now, I, I don't really know what that means, to be honest. You know, uh, it, when, you, when I think of rotating, it's a spatial thing that's not really what they're talking about in, in terms of um, encoding of information. It's, it's, it, it is, is more about... Uh, it is a neuro, neuro space, which right. is a very abstract concept. Right. Yeah. And this whole... And, and it's above my... I mean, you know, I'm a neuroscientist, but it's above my head in terms of um, trying to figure out what that means for in the, re- in the real life sense. But, I mean, the one thing that I would say is that, you know, it is... Um, it's not really clear how the brain stores these these sensory uh, information, the, the sensory information associated with the memory, um, so that it's so tightly associated with the experience. Because um, we know that the way the brain first processes that information has to go through the sensory uh, parts of the brain, the cortex. But the ultimate site of where that long term memory is encoded. Also, so it could be distributed across different parts of the brain, um, and so you know we really need to figure out where where that core piece of information is stored, and then how does it grab onto all the yeah. experiential parts of it, um, and and whether and you know how that sort of interplays with your immediate experience, and you recall it, and it's not disrupting your immediate experience is key to memory. And of course we know that when that kind of, um, dissociation happens, that's what, uh, hallucinations are. That's where you think that you're seeing something, a sensory ex- experience is happening to you, but it's not real, or you're, you're sort of recalling a, a sensory experience and you think it's happening to you right now. So those are the, so we do need to understand how the, inf- the information in the brain is being, stored and recalled, not just for the basic science part of it, but also I think it'll shed light on these yeah. pretty common mm-hmm. psychiatric disorders where you you know lots of people end up um, having some sort of hallucinatory experience in their lifetimes. Yeah, actually, the paper that um, Ingrid uh, cited for the, from the Quanta magazine, um, I actually dipped my toes a little bit into that to see what it's about. And I we could talk about it a little bit. It will probably take maybe 
five minutes, mm, or ahead, sure. we could skip it because it's it's computational neuroscience, which is way beyond way above my pay grade. I'm not a computational neuroscientist, um, but it does have some interesting uh, some interesting finding that might be worth talking about. Are you guys up for it? Yeah, five minutes sure. of yeah computational stuff. All right, okay. So the paper that uh, Ingrid mentioned, actually, I'll quickly mention it. Um, it is from Alexandra Libby and Timothy Bushman, uh, and they're at Princeton. And what they did, um, what they're interested in is, so ah, so I should briefly mention the paper that we covered, uh, the smell paper we covered, and why it's relevant to this other paper that Ingrid brought up. So the smell paper that we covered, um, uh, I'm guessing it's Twin20, uh, the experimenter gave mice, uh, smell over and over again, over and over again, the same smell. And they found, and then they recorded from the um, olfactory cortex where smell are process, processed by the brain. And they found, even though they gave the same smell over and over again, over a month, um, you would expect, since it's the same smell, the brain should encode it the same way over that month. And therefore, the response that you measure from the brain should be the same over the month. But instead, it kind of changes and it drifts around, so they said. Um, so, and this is a conundrum because how does, you know, how come when we smell the same thing over and over again, how come our interpretation of that smell is still the same, even though the representation in our brain is drifting? So in this paper that Ingrid suggested, the experimenters actually didn't look at smell, but they're, look, they're looking at sound. So they had, they had mice and they recorded from the auditory cortex, which is the cortex that is responsible for responding to sound. Um, and they basically played mice tones in sequence. So it's kind of, I'm going to draw a quick analogy. So they did the equivalent of playing mice uh, a sound such as Tom Cruise, Right. So when I say Tom Cruise, it is two different sound. And you can measure the response that you get from the auditory cortex to Tom Cruise. And because it's two different sound, um, you would expect that the measurement in your brain to be different for Tom and for Cruise. Right. Um, but one of the difficulties, so we're getting a little bit to the nitty-gritty of computational neuroscience. You stick a bunch of electrodes in the auditory cortex and you're a mouse and you hear the word Tom and all your neurons are firing and then you hear the word Cruise and all your neurons are firing again. Um, how do you make sense of that? How do you kind of decode the brain while the brain is recording? And um, the way they it's so I've been like I've thought about this, and one of the analogy that I could think of is actually um, uh, I've been listening to Swift, and one of the analogy that might apply is actually in Corona. In right now, we're going through a pandemic, and we have been looking for this thing called correlate of protection um, when we give uh, people vaccine. Um, when we give people. We've been giving people a bunch of different vaccines across the world, and we don't know what predicts how effective those vaccines are. And it's <clears throat> the and we would like to know have some predictors of whether a vaccine is going to be pr protective. Um, that would generalize across all these different vaccines, right? And the way people have been doing it for COVID is that they've been measuring inside uh, the subject a whole bunch of different um, uh, uh, measures across different dimensions. So, for example, people tend to measure. So this is just for an example. I might be, Vincent, do correct me if I'm wrong, but this is just kind of like an illustrative example. People have been measuring, you know, uh, neutralizing antibody, T cell activation, um, different kinds of cytokine. So you can imagine, um, you know, you can have, let's say, two different vaccines, one vaccine gives you a very high level of protection against, say, disease and hospitalization and death. And a second vaccine gives you low level of protection. And your job as a scientist is to, based on all the measure that you get from the blood work, all these cytokines, all these uh, uh, antibodies and T cell activation, can you predict whether uh, 
whether the outcome is going to be high level of protection or low level of protection. And this is kind of similar to what you have to do in the brain. So in the brain, um, the experimenter gave them sounds such as Tom and Cruise, so two different sounds, and they're measuring um, a whole bunch of neurons, so many different dimensions, many, many neurons, and they're trying to find a rule to tell them apart whether the mouse heard Tom or Cruise. So going back to the COVID coronavirus examples, um, if, you, if you have got the patient's blood work for patients or the patients that has high level of protection versus patient's blood work for low level protection, you can try to come up with some rules based on that would separate these two patient groups apart, these outcomes apart. So for example, perhaps, uh, you know, high level T cell activation and cytokine ABC predicts that you would have very high level of protection against death. Whereas, you know, if you don't get T cell activation, you have very low level of protection. So this would be one set of rules that tells you, uh, that gives you, uh, uh, that tells you whether, it's one set of rules that can separate out whether you have protection against disease and death. But let's say you have a second uh, measure in the COVID case where the patient, you also, you also have um, a measurement of not just protection against disease or death, but also the loss of smell. So for example, we know that COVID can also cause a loss of smell in patients, right? And you can also go back to your blood work and try to find within this blood work, are there a different set of rule that can predict whether the patient has lost a sense of smell? So you can search through it and try to see whether you can separate your patients. These patients have lost a sense of smell. This patient haven't lost a sense of smell. And you can find a different set of rules that would... <clears throat> so for example, one set of rules might be for losing the sense of smell. You might find if you have like very good antibody uh, against muco... Give you very good mucosa protection, then it would you know, correlate very well with protecting against loss of smell. So you found two different set of rules. One, one set of rules predict whether you're going to be protected against disease and death. And a second set of rule that tells you whether you would be protected against uh, loss of sense of smell. Um, so in the brain, you also have, you can apply a similar thing. So instead of, instead of measuring different cytokines and different, you know, T cell activation and stuff, along diff so those are the different dimensions, right? T cell activation, cytokine, uh, antibody. You have neuron one, from mouse, from a mouse, neuron number two, neuron number three, neuron number four, and you apply the same same kind of recipe of trying to find rules that would give you whether the mouse is listening to Tom or Cruise. And these researchers basically found that they can train an algorithm that would tell you uh, uh, whether the mouse is encoding the word Tom or the, whether the mouse is encoding the word Cruise. And what they found actually is that, um, and not only that, they also presented not just Tom Cruise, they also presented different set of stimuli. Like for example, um, they gave the mouse, you know, another two words association, like, you know, uh, J-Lo, Jennifer Lopez. So they keep playing J and then keep playing low J-Lo together. So what they actually found is that at the beginning, when the mouse first heard Tom Cruise, two words, since these mouse never heard Tom Cruise before together, they encoded Tom and Cruise differently. So the set of rules that you find for the mouse inside the brain are completely different. But by day four of the, same, of the mouse hearing Tom Cruise over and over and over again, Tom, the set of rules encoding Tom and the set of rules encoding Cruise have started to become more and more similar. And the same thing for J-Lo. So the first day, the mouse hearing J and the mouse hearing Lo, completely different set of rules of neurons. But by the fourth day, J and Lo have become closer and closer together. So this is what they mean by the kind of like the computational axes can get rotated. Um, and this is all through learning. And they also further found that, you know, I won't go into all the detail. The um, listeners can go read it. They also found that even though the, 
the mouse is getting Tom and Cruise more and more confused by because they, it's been associated so much. The way they encode Tom and Cruise are more and more similar. They can find a third set of rules that suggests the mouse has, even though Tom and Cruise are, you know, getting mixed up, there's a separate memory of Tom when the mouse hears Cruise that are, you know, that is still retained. Anyway, I didn't explain it very, very well uh, because it's inherently very, very uh, difficult thing to explain commutation of neuroscience. Um, but uh, one, th I would just like to highlight the reason why I'm kind of spending time on this is that in the COVID case, when we're doing blood work and we're trying to look for correlate of protection, um, it makes sense when, when we get the outcome and the rule for protection against death and disease is that, you know, for ex just for ex just for the sake of argument, let's say T cell activation and cytokine A comes back as being very important for, for protection against death. Um, as a scientist, you can then look at those T cells and those um, cytokines and see whether they really are involved. And if yes, how are they involved? So you can actually do some science afterwards. But in the mouse case, if you look at the mouse's brain and which neurons are activated when you say Tom Cruise, um, let's say you can find some really good rule that tells you apart whether the mouse is listening to Tom versus Cruise. Um, the outcome is not cytokine a, cytokine B, T cell activation, the outcome is neuron 1, 4, and 5 is really good at encoding TOM, and neuron 2, 4, and 6 is really good, good at encoding Cruise. It doesn't really, it's really difficult to generalize it across different mice and to use it to make further prediction and further study. So this is like a very, very difficult, that's why computational neuroscience is very difficult. Um, anyway, so it's, yeah, it's difficult doing computational neurosciences. It's... Uh, yeah, it's a conclusion. Anyway, mm -hmm. that was a taste mm -hmm. of how it's, uh, uh, how, that's a brief taste of that paper for the listener. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, you have the next email from I know, Dave. I've now completely forgotten what, what is happening. Dave. Uh, uh, okay. Is it me that has the next oh, email? I think it's, yeah, yeah I think it's uh, Jason. All okay. right. Um, so this is from Dave Jackson, Dr. Dave Jackson. Good day, twino, twinos of neuroscientific knowledge. In 2012, Ori said, adeno-associated viruses that overexpress these genes are RNAi constructs to reduce the expression of these genes. Is this kind of procedure where a specific gene is introduced into cells using viral vectors doable in the same sense as, yeah, we can build a channel tunnel, or as, yeah, we can fly a plane from here to Paris, or perhaps as, yeah, I can call my friend in Paris on the phone. <laughs> uh, how much time and perhaps money would it take to create a viral vector that introduces RNAi for a segment after one had the nucleic acid sequence in question? I expect that large segments will be more costly than shorter ones, also, some viruses will infect certain types of cells more than others, which would be good if they were infecting the cells under study and bad if they were preferentially infecting cells that were not. So what is the current context? Do you guys do this or would you have to contract out? So I can, yeah, I can answer this because we, we do this uh, in my lab and sort of stepping, uh, taking a step back here about the terminology. So, um, you know, one real... Um, breakthrough in being able to manipulate gene expression and protein expression in cells is something called RNA interference. And this was actually discovered um, in, in C. elegans, a worm. And this is a natural actual pathway in the, in, in the worm that the RNA um, that comes in, so the, the worm eats something and then there's some RNA or it gets a, a viral or bacterial infection. There's a whole bunch of different um, sensors that can sense that RNA and then break it down uh, and, and basically destroy that RNA. And um, this is, again, a natural uh, evolved pathway. But one of the sort of translational aspects of taking that uh, pathway was that they learned how this RNA is broken down into little bits and then how that those little bits actually can interfere or uh, degrade that RNA. And so now you can basically buy 
these short RNA interference sequences that are predicted to block or reduce the expression of X protein or X RNA. So that's been um, you know pretty useful. And so now in, in neuroscience, we can make a viral vector that actually encodes that sequence of RNA that's predicted to break down or uh, destroy the target RNA. And that can then basically reduce the protein expression of interest. And um, up until the, the most recent version of gene editing called CRISPR, RNAi was, was really used quite a lot. Um, it's not used as much anymore, partly because those short pieces of RNA uh, can have non-target, off-target effects. That they're, they're not always specific to the target that you want it to be. Um, but, it, but in principle, the bioinformatics and the design of these RNAs is very easy. There's programs that allow you to do that. And then you just have to test how good, you know, you can try a bunch of different sequences and see which ones work the best and then stick it in that virus, which you can then put into a mouse. Um, so, and so doing that, you know, it takes about a couple of months to probably get your final RNA interference, um, uh, that w- is working well, and um, and then once you've got that, it, it, it's pretty straightforward. But again, I would say actually most um, folks, even in neuroscience now, are sort of moving away from RNAi to, to using CRISPR, which is a lot more specific um, and um, and and is, is using and most I think non-brain folks are using CRISPR for sure. The, the one downside in using CRISPR in the brain is that um, the most common form of CRISPR actually uses the, takes advantage of something called DNA repair. So it breaks a piece of DNA and then the cell ordin- will normally repair that piece of DNA. And so um, the CRISPR can excise the, the sequence of interest and then the, the cell does the rest of the work and it, it, it repairs that DNA. But most of that happens in cell division when cells are dividing. And we know, as you know, neurons don't divide. So um, so the, the sort of efficiency of that process is not as good in, in neurons as it is in other cells. But there have been a couple of uh, tweaks to the CRISPR te- technology that's allowed um, neur- neurons to be used as well. Oh, I didn't know that. DNA repair is less efficient, like less carried out in neurons than in other cells. Yeah, yeah. That sucks that's, for neurons. Yeah, and, and and there's a whole topic we could have on DNA repair and neurons, but um, but but essentially that mostly happens in dividing cells. Hmm. I'm guessing you can't make a neuron try to divide because that probably isn't healthy for the neuron. No, it's not good. Because that's, that's where you start to get brain cancers. I mean, the, the the cells that are dividing in the brain are glia, the glial cells, mm. and they're they're um, they're stem cell populations that can repopulate glia, and the glia divide. But again, the gliomas, and when 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 glial cells uh, divide uncontrollably, that's when you have cancer. Mm. All right. The next one is about polio, so I think I'll take it. This is again from Dave. Good day, vectors of twin festation. I have a polio question, which I hope is appropriate for neuroscience. You guys have the shortest email list in the Twixiverse, so I have some hope of hearing the answer while I still remember why I asked the question. Maybe not, Dave. I don't know. <laughs> it's been as a while. I under- as I understand the history, polio was originally thought to be a respiratory infection due to an unfortunate choice of animal model, even after the mode of transmission was correctly identified, only non-pharmaceutical interventions were available. That's correct. So the early days, the early 1900s, they were using monkey models where they could get infection by putting the virus intranasally and it would cross the uh, olfactory epithelium through the uh, olfactory nerves and into the brain. But that's not how it happens in people at all. It's fecal-oral Transmission. Uh, For decades, communities had to adopt policies to reduce the spread. I believe hand washing was encouraged with public education programs aimed at both school children and adults. Presumably, there were other interventions that, in retrospect, were not as effective. Swimming pools were closed. Some communities did not allow non residents to enter. 
My point is that there were decades of public education programs, some more influential than others, and behavioral interventions, some more effective than others. Can our experience with polio inform our decisions regarding interventions in public education with respect to COVID, which, like polio, we did not understand and could not explain its pathogenesis? Thank you for all you do. So the difference, Dave, is that we had a vaccine or several vaccines within a year. So, uh, so that's one thing. It, it took 50 years to get polio vaccines, to get the first one. So there was a lot of time that people had to devise interventions. And you're right, some of them worked and some of them didn't. For example, the, the practice of quarantine was useless. Uh, in New York, police would go from apartment to apartment and identify paralyzed kids and take them to the hospital to quarantine them. They would just take them out of the home and... Uh, unbelievable. You would never do wow. that today. And it turns out that only one in one or 200 infections lead to paralysis. So quarantine is useless because most of the people walking around and infected are spreading the infection. It's one of the things we learned. Unfortunately, Dave, you have a good point, but people forget. And we have now a whole different generation of people doing our public health. And they don't remember. And more seriously, they don't read. <laughs> And this is one of my pet peeves, that you forget what has been done in the past, then you repeat it, essentially. So we would do well to go back and, and look, but people don't, don't do that much anymore. The older people do it, but mostly they're not in charge anymore. And so uh, I'm, I'm afraid we repeat our mistakes over and over again. Yeah. I mean, we're repeating our mistakes even in the same yeah. pandemic. I Within mean, two cycles. Of the, of the <laughs> I mean, we're not even learning from our last year's mistakes. Yes. I mean, yeah. No, it's just unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Is there um, any... So if when so smallpox has been eradicated and polio is on its way to being eradicated, um, is there any... Is there any fear that the the scientific knowledge associated with smallpox and polio would also be a bit more easily forgotten, if that's the case? Or is there still viruses similar to polio that it, or smallpox that is ravaging the world that makes it necessary to know all those things? Uh, I think that that's a good point. I mean, there's certainly other pox viruses that are worked on, so you can do that. But... I mean, if you're for polio, a lot of the, many people worked on polio for many years, and and now the field is contracted, and most people have forgotten yeah. uh, a lot of the principles learned with with polio, and uh, that's I, I I think it's a problem. I agree, and I think you're going to soon have a generation who know nothing about polio, and make mistakes working on related viruses as a consequence. Yeah, and, and reinvent the wheel. I don't know what we can do about it, frankly. Because, you know, science is an independent thing. You, you run your lab, you get your own grants, et cetera. So <laughs> as long as you get your grants, it doesn't matter. Mm. Um, I, we have one here from someone named Tim, which is, in fact, Tim here. <laughs> so uh, Yeah, <laughs> I'm we, not going to read my own email. You know, you it's just suggesting that. papers. It's a section of papers. So let's skip it. And why don't you, uh, Tim, read Margie? Okay. Margie writes, greeting twin friends. I'm so excited to have a real reason to email you. I've been trying to come up with an excuse since twin 10 when you didn't have any letters and requested emails. Come to think, do I get bonus points for non-COVID-19 questions? <laughs> LOL, yes. Yes, Marjorie, you get bonus points. Um, background, I have multiple sclerosis, so a bit of familiarity with neurodegeneration. I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, I was an elementary school teacher and then an elementary school librarian. I'm now medically retired. Uh, fair warning in advance, I'm very good at unintentionally making short stories long, so apologies for the length. Today, Wednesday, October 28th, 2020, so that is more than one year ago, I'm sorry to say. Sorry, Margie, I hope you're still listening. <laughs> um, there was a report shared that caused quite a hopeful stir in my MS, so that's Multiple Sclerosis Gym Facebook group. Here's the link shared for the report made on a local new TV news show. I'll also add screenshots for the transcript. Um, so Mar Margie provided a link, uh, which I think I looked at quite a long time ago, but it was, um, Margie also provided the paper that talks about the link, so I'll continue. Uh, it turns out that 
The new stir is caused because a new publication from October 2020 in Nature Immunology entitled, uh, titled a new, neutrophil sub a new Neutrophil Subset Promotes CNS Neuron Survival and Axon Regeneration. And Margie provided a link to that article. I'd like to suggest this as an article for you guys to discuss, especially as I've not yet found a way to read more than the summary. Uh, quite possibly, I won't, uh, and in, uh, in, in parentheses, quite possibly I won't understand it much without a lot of thinking and study. So not being able to ac access the whole paper might be a moot point anyway, uh, which would make listening to you guys discuss it much more useful and valuable to me. Uh, hin hin, ahem. Okay, so yeah, so Margie linked uh, a paper um, where the uh, it was published last last year. The first author is Andrew Sass, and last author is Benjamin uh, Siegel. Um, very briefly, uh, these uh, authors found that they discovered uh, a neutral uh, a granel a gran granulocyte. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing these immunology words correctly but uh, a granulocyte with a characteristics of an immature neutrophil um, that might uh, promote axon regeneration. Um, and I think Vivian, uh, a while ago, highlighted this paper as a potential uh, twin discussion paper for the future. So, uh, yeah, potentially, Margie, uh, keep listening. We might discuss this paper. I mean, it is true that we always, I think, for the most part, think of neuroinflammation or infl inflammation as, as a bad thing, in any context, but then you've got to think about, well, why does the body want to do this in the first place? Um, and the fact that maybe this promotes regener re regeneration, I think is, is really fascinating. We know that these um, glial cells can do that, that they're really important for regenerating tissue and, uh, and they can do that in other animals. So why they don't necessarily do that in humans is not clear, but Mm. But yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of cool to think about this in a, in inflammation as a, as a pro versus a con. <laughs> yeah, but I think this the, this neutral fill thing would be would be I don't know probably the innate arm of the uh, immune system, yeah. and I I'm, and people keep saying the brain is immunoprivileged and it should be kicking like keeping these immune cells out of it so that yeah so, I think that that idea I think is that that idea gone. is kind of increasingly uh, disproved so maybe it is going in and doing things yeah but yeah probably in the future we will talk about this paper um, okay so so Margie actually has I can't remember how many questions like maybe it's like six or seven questions yeah. uh, should we go through all of them or should I no, I can I think we should do one or two. Be so, okay. Margie, this was sent in a long time ago. We answered, I think, some uh, of them already. Okay. Some of them think, already, but uh, so let's just do one or do two. Do one. Okay, so Margie's first question, in addition to her comment about the paper previously, Margie's first question, which we have not answered, um, uh, goes like this. Mm -hmm. From what I read in the extended data, the in vivo experiments looked at the optic nerve. So this is probably the, the uh, neutral field paper that we just mentioned. Um, and Margie said, in Twin 8, you guys discuss glia to neuron conversion by CRISPR-Cas treatment alleviate symptoms of neurological disease in mice. By the way, so, that, that, that whole paper, there was a lot of controversy about that, and, and there's been a couple of rebuttals to that saying that it's not actually true. Uh, <laughs> you may want to revisit that at some point, but anyway, carry on. Okay, um, the neuron, the neuron to glia conversion. That, yes, that glia to neuron. Sorry, yeah. glia to neuron. Um, so that, so uh, yeah. So uh, back to uh, back to Margie's. Um, so that paper discussed on Twin Eight uh, also looked at eye related neurons or cells. Apologies for the simplifications here and in future. The two papers uh, in that episode uh, look at different things. Oh no, sorry, the two papers, so the one in Twin8 talking about glia to neuron conversion and the one that Margie that just uh, related, which I think is the one to do with the granulocyte and neutrophil, uh, the two papers look at different things. A protein in the case of the glia to neuron conversion versus white blood cell in the case of the granulocyte, um, but they seem parallel. Um, so I can't comment on that because I haven't looked uh, in, in detail of the of this granulocyte paper. Both seem to be looking at regeneration in nerve cells. 
but I can't really tell if they're looking at the same thing or just similar things. Can you guys expound ex or s explain it to me? Um, so this I can probably quickly hasten a guess. So in the glio, glia to neuron conversion uh, paper, it was, if I remember correctly, trying to convert glio cells into neurons because in, tho in those papers, they're looking at Parkinson's disease, uh, which I work on, so I remember this. And in Parkinson's disease, the dopamine neurons are already dead and you're trying to get new ones to be born because neurons usually either are not born in the adult or are born very, very uh, sparsely and very in very low numbers in the adult. I think there's also controversy in that in humans. Um, uh, so in the Parkinson's gliotoneuron case, you are making neurons come up from scratch, from birth, and then the neurons have to actually make an axon and go to the right place. And according to those papers, which have since been called into question and the controversy is still ongoing, those papers suggest that you can convert a glia cells to neuron from scratch. And once converted, these neurons will be able to send an axon all the way to where, they want, where they're supposed to go. Um, whereas in the granulocyte paper, I believe, I haven't read it, but I believe the neurons are probably still there. The cell bodies are still surviving. It is the axon that's been injured and their job is to just send a new axons uh, at, to go to the right place. Although I, I could be wrong. Um, yeah, so those might be... Right. Um, so those, based on that, there might be two different, two different things. I think there's Vincent. one interesting question here about authorship. Um, ah, okay. That that you know we could probably clarify. Um, so that's the fifth question. Yeah. Okay. Should I read it? Sure. Okay. So fifth question from Margie says also about authorship uh, from the article website contributions. But yeah, so Margie for the fifth question, Margie has a question about authorship. So. From the article website, it says contributions, and then this set of authors performed experiments and data analysis. So these are what you know. Um, these are what uh, scientists usually write at the end of the paper to say, you know, in our paper there are ten authors. So we have to tell you know the wider public which author did what uh, respond, what what the author did, what how they contributed to the to the publication. So. You know, in this case, these sets of authors perform experiments and data analysis. This other person oversaw RNA seq analysis. This other person wrote the manuscript and co edited with the help of other authors. And then a bunch of other people directed the studies. So it tells you a little bit about, you know, the kind of roles that, that people do. So Margie continued In school librarian world, the person who does the writing is the author, but the person who wrote the manuscript isn't the first author listed. I'm guessing maybe in the principal investigators are listed first in the author list, question mark. And how do they decide who gets to be first author anyway? Ooh, controversial. And why is, it, why is that so important? Also, well, also very controversial. I hear it emphasized often in the different micro TV podcasts. Is it something to do with a publish or perish part of university professorship? Well, that is assuming you get a university professorship. <laughs> um, so that is Margie's question. So Jason, do you have any Jason and Vincent, do you have any comments yeah. on this? No, this is. I mean, it's it's sort of a uh, you know a good question because from the outside it looks bizarre. Um, and there's all these conventions, and and probably these conventions are slightly different different fields. But in biology and biomedical sciences, this is the convention, which is that the first authors, the first couple of people in the in the author list, they're the ones that actually do the science. They're the, at the bench. Um, and they contribute the experimental data, and oftentimes the the first author is the person that also analyzes that data and then puts it together. And the last author is usually the person who funded the work, um, who is mentoring the people in the lab and is helping intellectually with um, all the aspects of sort of designing the experiments and coming up with sort of the big picture questions, um, and then ultimately also helping write the paper. Um, and that's the convention. There's everything in between. And it's true that it, in terms of what's really important is the person that's first and the person that's last. Um, partly because then the first person in the list is considered the person who did the most work towards the paper, contributing to the paper. And the last person is, is thought to be sort of the potentially the intellectual leader and the person who was able to get all the resources for the, the studies. 
Um, and, and so those are, and they're different, um, they're, they're important for different parts of the, of the academic career trajectory. The first authors are looking to get ultimately that, um, uh, leadership position where they can run their own lab. And, and then the, the, the last author, the, who, the person who has the lab is looking to convince funders that they've been productive and can get funding. So, so those, that's why the, 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 the order is so important in these papers. Um, and you know, I'll, I, there's a lot of debate of this, uh, because it is controversial. It, it oftentimes is quite, um, anxiety inducing when you have 10 people that are working on a project and you have to figure out who is first and what the order is. And then there's big team science and collaboration. So I think that these are discussions that are ongoing. Um, and then it's, it's really down to us as in, in the positions that we peer review people to try and really figure out what, what is the uh, important aspects of the job that they've done um, and, and who gets attributed what, and not just base that on orders, the order of the, the, the um, publication um, list, uh, authorship. I mean, in some places, some fields like physics do it alphabetically. So um, it's not like it's not doable either. Uh, and and they, they get away with, I mean, they're, they're obviously, they've figured out a system there. So yeah, um, that's really why that order is so important though for um careers yeah but i think that some some of them have been like partially like the first author who gets first author sometimes can be partially like any tension might be partially mitigated by having co-first author so sometimes you see you know five co-first author because they all you know helped out to do bulk of the work all right um so we didn't make it very far but let's uh stop and save the rest for another time that'll do it for twin number 25, the uh, last episode for 2021. Here's hoping that 2022 is a little better, not for twin, but for the world. Uh, you can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash twin. You can send us your questions and comments, twin at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, uh, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. We're now a 501c3, so your contributions... Uh, are now federal U.S. tax deductible. Jason Shepard is at the University of Utah. S Jason Synaptic on Twitter. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. And thanks yeah, to everyone who's been writing in. Sorry that we've been bad at replying. We do read them. And, um, you know, I think this is fun. We, we should certainly do this again. Um, but keep the questions coming in. Your, your interest is really valuable. Tim Chung is at New York University. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, Jason. And thanks, everyone, for writing in. Yeah. Yes, thank you all. And, and please continue to do so. We'll try and be better in 2022 uh, about reading your emails. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next year. 